Hey, boo, hey, it's me, X Mayo. I'm a comedian, writer, producer, and taco expert. Also, when it comes to confidently managing my finances, your girl is a beginner, for sure. So I want you to join me on the dough. Lemonada Media's new 10-episode podcast series as I dive into better understanding the financial trap doors that any of us could fall into. And I've fallen, you know, I keep on falling like Alicia Keys, okay? But if you've ever stayed in a bad relationship to avoid moving out costs or just found yourself swimming in debt, you are not alone. Each week, I'll be exploring all types of financial flops and money myths that stand in the way of our financial freedom. On this show, Cash is Queen. We hardly know her, but baby, we are determined to be her best friend. The dough is out now, wherever you get your podcasts. Meet Jeanette McCurdy. She's an author, a writer, and a big feeler. So much so that she's making a podcast all about her feelings. Jeanette's memoir, I'm Glad My Mom Died, welcomed the world into the story of Jeanette and all of the intense life experiences that molded her into the person she is today. But how does she manage all of the messy, hard feelings she's feeling right now? In each episode of Hard Feelings, her new podcast with Lemonada Media, she'll tell you all about it. Jealousy, shame, social anxiety. She wants to laugh about it, cry about it, and work through it with you by her side. Why? These hard feelings are a big part of the human condition. They unite us all, but only once we're willing to face them. Hard Feelings is out now, wherever you get your podcasts. Lemonada. Okay, actually, can you just pretend that you're listening to a fully complete theme song here? I got really in my head, and I tried to make it perfect, and I couldn't. So this is going to be the theme song right here. (laughs) Hello, and welcome to another episode of Funny Because It's True. I'm Elise Myers. Today, we have clog lover, author, and princess of the Midwest, Maria Bamford. Maria is an absolute icon who created viral TikTok-worthy character work in her show, The Maria Bamford Show. She's also had an amazing stand-up career and has often been referred to as the comedian's favorite comedian. Her new book, Sure, I'll Join Your Cult, is an incredible memoir that fully translates her unique voice from the stages to the pages. We discuss the very specific details of her book deal, Bag Salads and John Hamm, and also Maria helped me settle a debate between me and my producers as to whether a full ice cream sundae is a meal or a snack. So two things that are funny because they're true. Number one, at the time of this recording, I am 36 weeks pregnant, so I will be going on maternity leave soon, my friends. And number two, it's not often that you encounter somebody like Maria Bamford who is so radically honest, Um, and I just found that really, really refreshing in this interview. So um, just listen for that. It's really fun. All right, let's get started. Maria Bamford, icon. (laughs) Hi. Thank you. Yo, you're the icon. You have a podcast, for God's sakes. I don't have the heart to tell her that pretty much everyone has a podcast nowadays, so I'm just going to take this compliment and run. You know what? We're, I'm just I'm just trying to get to your level at some point in my career. I I heard a really funny fact about you, and I wanted to ask. I heard that you love clogs. Is this true? How did we find this love for clogs? What is this? Well, I like a high heeled shoe, but then I I don't have the uh, gymnastic ability to maintain that. Yeah, they're just they're real nice. They feel hand hewn. There's wood. They're made of wood. Right. When I heard that you loved him, I went through and I just like went, my, my producers were sending me links to them because I was like, they're so cute. I need a million pairs of them. Well, they're, yeah, that's the other thing is you can order them online in whatever color. What color are you currently loving? I, I have a pair of patent leather red ones that I wear on stage. All right, I'm not going to lie to you. I had no idea that stage was stage, and I spent like the next three minutes trying to figure out what fancy event this was. I really resonate with what you did in the Maria Bamford show because you were doing short form content like 10 years before its time. How did you come up with that? Because, well, nobody wanted to hire me. Oh, wow. So, yeah. (laughs) Honestly, great. (laughs) It was, uh, um, no one was interested, and so... I was I was very interested in hiring me. Yes. And so I gave myself all the parts in the show 
And I did a lot of one person shows. I like live performance. And so I did um, a lot of that and did like a one person show playing all the characters in my family because uh, I, I couldn't seem to get on a sitcom. And so I made my own version of a sitcom. And I love that. Um, yeah. So then, but you're, yes, you are the future, madame. You are, and the now. <laughs> I, I want to go back because I, I wanted to talk to you about the different characters you do because I feel really like most comfortable playing every part uh, because mm. that's what I'm used to. And so when I was watching kind of the intros you would do to your show and then like you go back and forth with the different angles, that's what I do. And so yeah, it right. was like oh, cool. I, I feel really comfortable doing that. But it's so funny because most people don't realize when you're making something like that, it really is just you in a room talking to nobody like – adjacent to the the camera. And yes. I, I wondered if when you were creating those characters and, and talking to yourself basically for the filming of this, like, were you making up material that later you would use in your standup or did you keep those pretty separate? I think it went the opposite way for me. Okay. Said, I didn't do it. I, I did it on stage and then did it in uh, videos. Got it. But it seems like it had the same result. Yeah. Um, but there's something about... Yeah, live performance. And I don't know, it's because I've done it since I was like three. I was uh, did stage stuff. So I feel, I do like the feeling of, of hearing laughs in person. Have you always known you wanted to do stand-up or did you want to perform in other ways too? I just liked being on stage and I liked attention. And then I liked making people laugh. I definitely have always enjoyed that from a young age. And so I didn't really know that was a job option. Yeah. Um, and hopefully that's changed for people. Uh, I think now it's more of a, you know, people go, oh, yes, I can uh, be my own gatekeeper and, you know, let myself make stuff. So it sounds like, I mean, you have five employees on this podcast already. <laughs> I think you're doing all right. You're doing okay. It takes a team. I can do the the interviewing part. That that I can do. <laughs> I, well, that's that's hard. I, I, I've i only interviewed people a few times and it was, I found that anxiety provoking. I Yes. Oh, no, I definitely feel anxious. I feel very anxious right now oh and all God. the time. So it's all good. Oh my but God. I, I try and just figure out how to do it at the same time. I, I For a lot of my life, I felt it, my anxiety kept me back from a lot of things. And I realized you can be both anxious and doing it at the same time. And yes. they kind of ha can happen, at, you know, they can work together. And so I'm working on it. It's not perfect all the time. There's a lot of things I've bailed on and and uh, I look back and I regret and I'm trying to kind of like re redo those experiences. But, um, man, I'm just so tired of saying no to things because I'm too nervous to do it. I'm so, so tired of doing that. And so stand up, honestly, is one thing that I I know I will need to say yes to at some point, um, whether, it, whether I feel ready or not. But uh, I, I just even if it's a couple times, I want to <laughs> just conquer yeah. it so I can say I did it. <laughs> God, and it's so available. Um, there's an open mic every two blocks, and there's Zoom open mics with, um, uh, and you know, you can be very anonymous. Oh, I know that. And don't have to say who you are, or you know, can put in a weird name or put yourself as a cartoon character. This is an introvert's dream. Interesting. I did not know that existed. Yeah, yeah. The hoop is much larger than you think to jump through. It's a, uh, <laughs> yeah. I love that. I heard that you were just workshopping, and this might be wrong, but I heard you were workshopping new material for like an an hour set at 9 a.m. somewhere. Is 8 that true? 8 a.m. 8 a.m. in my neighborhood. I am a fan of making it as easy as possible. If I can be semi-conscious, it can be <laughs> less than a mile from my house. That would be ideal, and so it came to pass. Have you only done it once or multiple times? Oh, a bunch of times. And I live in Los Angeles where there's always people available to watch you be in process about something. Where are you in Ala or not Nebraska, not Alaska? Uh, Omaha. Well, I grew up in the Midwest, so it was like, I don't know, at least Minnesota, I was not trained to speak publicly. It was very much like, keep it quiet over there. And uh, yeah, so... so <laughs> if, that, if that was the way that you were brought up, how did you train yourself to be such a public performer? Well, because I think there's a bit of light autism as well as 
Um, yeah, I also have an anger management problem. <laughs> it's all passive aggressive, though, where I will um, get mad about stuff. And then instead of addressing the person face to face, I will talk about it on stage, which is it's so not like, kind of like therapy, kind of working it out. Yeah. Well, is it? We're not. It's, a, We're just- it's not <laughs> ideal. I think if you talk to my loved ones, they'd say, I wish she had told me <laughs> before oh, no. putting it on that album. Do you um, have stories like that where you oh, made a joke yes. and they came to you and yes. were like, no, really? Yes, of course. Yes. Like, I feel like how, how to say the line is where is my experience and I get to talk about something from my perspective and then what is uh, hurtful and going to destroy a relationship. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, I, I guess this is a sad way of just saying I go, uh, I just, you know, like I, I gave my sister this book to read that I have coming out and, and she was like, okay. <laughs> and that's your new book, Cheryl, Join Your Cult, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And that, um, you know, yeah, we talk every day. So I'm sure she would tell me something, <laughs> but maybe not, maybe not. We both come from the same uh, not talking about it uh, point of view from the Midwest. So, so maybe not. All right, we have to take a quick break. But when we come back, Maria tells us about her relationship to fame. You want to know what's music to my ears? Bread bowls. And that brings me to our beloved sponsor, Panera. Whenever I'm not sure what I'm going to do for dinner, but I know I want something nourishing that I'll really enjoy, I pick up Panera on the way home. Plus, with Panera's new crunch time feature, Panera will send you a reminder at whatever time you want to order your favorite preset dinner with one easy swipe. It's been an absolute game changer to make sure dinner is taken care of while I'm out running around. I'm going to start with my favorite, their mac and cheese, featuring a creamy, rich blend of cheeses. But I also like to mix it up too, and Panera makes it easy. Sometimes I'll go with their Fuji apple salad with chicken. Or I'll try one of their unbeatably delicious and hearty soups, like their creamy tomato soup. It's a classic, and I have found no soup that pairs better with their warm, fresh bread bowl. And I have done plenty of research, trust me. So order Panera tonight to get a delicious dinner in one easy swipe. Available only in iOS mobile devices. Other restrictions apply. And for more information on clean, visit panerabread.com slash clean. I would love to take a second to tell you guys about Tara, the founder of Dreamland Baby. If you're a fan of this show, then you've heard me talk about Dreamland Baby before, but essentially it's a game changer for any parent with babies. So Tara was a new mom when she founded Dreamland Baby. Essentially, she was so fed up with how few solutions there were out there to help get her baby to sleep that she went out and designed her own, the doctor-approved, award-winning Dreamland Baby weighted sleep sack. She'd go on to be featured in Forbes for it and even make a deal on Shark Tank. So far, she's helped over 500,000 parents out, keeping their baby sleeping soundly and restoring a lot of sleep to them in the process. The sleep sack evenly distributes weight from your baby's top to bottom. Kind of like how weighted blankets help adults sleep, the sleep sack's cover calm technology helps babies unlock deeper sleep too. The sleep sack can be worn three ways, both arms in, one arm out, or both arms out. And it's made of 100% soft and natural cotton, super easy to throw in the wash, which is always important. Go to dreamlandbabyco.com and enter my code Elise at checkout to receive 20% off site-wide and free shipping. This offer is for new and existing customers. That's dreamlandbabyco.com and code Elise at checkout for 20% off. It's interesting that you've used comedy and writing your sets as a form of talking things through that you don't feel comfortable talking through with people in real time. Yes. And I would imagine that that is probably much more of a common experience than you would think because I, I've always felt that way about music, um, less about the comedy, but more about the processing. Like I, I've said a little bit before, but I, I use music and writing music as a way of processing emotion. And then I use comedy once it's processed and it's funny as a way of like telling the story to other people. And, um, and a lot of my music has been me telling the story back to myself the way I remembered it and processing that. Mm. And so it sounds like that's what you do with your comedy. And so I feel like many creative outlets do that. But yeah, that's the kind of, I love 
stuff where it comes from an autobiographical place yeah. and it's clear that it comes from an autobiographical place. Like, um, yeah, I'm much more a nonfiction person uh, than I am fiction. I, I love to hear what really happened, even if it's just according to one person. Yeah. Like, And I do have a prejudice that I think if somebody talks about something on stage, I think that's real. Like, there's some part of it that's real. Yeah, totally. There's probably always truth in the joke, even if it's been embellished for, you know, it, it, entertainment factor. There's got to be truth in some of it or else you wouldn't feel comfortable saying it. Yeah, and that sometimes people are trying to tell us something. Did you want to write stories to get people to know you? Like, what was the inspiration to do that? The inspiration for the book was a, a book deal of $150,000. <laughs> and uh... Are we allowed to say that? Can is that okay? <laughs> Which they I said love the honesty. We'll give you forty four thousand dollars if you start writing it. And then I did that and I get but I gave it I gave the money to an editor because I was so scared. I've never written a book, so I gave the money to this outside editor to help me to get me to write the book, sort of a, a witness, uh yeah, uh audience member. And um so did that and then uh then you get Forty-four more thousand dollars once you hand it into the book, and they say, "Oh yeah, it's a book," but you won't get it. You won't will not get it uh, unless they think it's a book. That's what the paperwork says. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, have you written a book? I'm I'm currently in the process of writing one right now. I just oh got my god. Okay, there the, you go. We're like signing contracts, and I'm. I'm about to head into maternity leave, so it, I won't have the manuscript in before then, which I w was hoping to, but it was a very lofty goal that I shouldn't have promised anyways. So I'll come back and get it in, and we'll start the process of them telling me if it's a book or not. <laughs> but yeah, I, I just, I love books, so I was like, well, I, I would like to try to write one. That sounds like a wonderful opportunity. Um, and if it doesn't work out, I will then have paid uh, fifty thousand dollars uh, to someone to learn that I didn't want to write a book. <laughs> Love it. So, in your book, you talk about your relationship to fame, um, and kind of how you got to this place that you wanted to get to. But then, once you got there, it didn't feel the way that you thought it would feel. Can you tell me a little bit about that? For sure. Like I had a commercial campaign that was popular, and then people started recognizing me as the character from the commercial. Interesting. And I just felt awful. And, and people started coming to shows to see this one character. What was the character? It was like a, a crazy Christmas character. It was from Target many years ago. And the problem is my act was very different from this particular character. It was just, um, I talk about depression and weir being a weirdo. And so I was setting myself up for these really rough shows. Um, Interesting. Yeah, it, that said, I was also paid very well to experience that. Yeah. Also, part of doing commercial stuff, you can't talk about the commercial. You can't have any critique of it once you have agreed to sign on for right. something. Um, whether that's, I'm, I'm sure you have sponsors where it's like, once somebody sponsors something, then you can't speak publicly in any way that is critical. So that I didn't realize, oh, that's the one thing I like doing stand up about is I get to say well, I get to say whatever I want. Did you make a conscious decision early in your life or is it your personality to be transparent about the like the money that you make in your career and also just the career itself? Because I feel like that is a piece you just do not hear in comedy. You do not hear because people will feel like it will affect their career, you know? Is this so um, something well, you made? To I'm old, you know, <laughs> I'm 52. Like, I really have nothing to lose at this point. I've, I don't, I've had all my dreams come true. Like I'm fully medicated. Like I don't, I've got tons of support and love and it's okay. You know, if, if somebody said, well, we are tired you because, you know, you told people what you made on this gig. Like I just, it's okay. I know I can retire at, at the age of 63 and, um, you know, I'm very privileged. So, um, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not risking a lot. Sure. What advice would you give to a comedian that would be risking a lot and, and how transparent they can and should be? Well, 
I think just asking yourself, well, I mean, and this is just from any kindness tradition, is is how would I want to be treated? In comedy, and this is one business, but this is across the board on, I would say the majority of businesses is the amount that you're paid it hasn't changed a lot. At least people are still paid, I believe, about 50 bucks a show for opening or middling on the road, which is what I was paid 30 years ago. So I think just ask yourself, just have some curiosity about what somebody's earning. Yeah. Um, and, and ask them if you're worried about them. Um, I know I've fucked up and you know, I've had employees need to ask me for a raise. And, you know, because I was like, I, I didn't know. And then I go, oh my God, yes, of course, of course. And I think that helps me also not build resentments over time. Yeah. And also have some, I, from what I've read about open book accounting, um, which is a theory of you, if you let everybody know what everybody's earning, then there's less mystery about it. Other people can negotiate. And also, you know what makes the business profitable. Mm-hmm. Um, so I try to let everybody who is interested, who works for me, know what I'm earning, you know, and what what all the expenses of the business are, uh, whether or not they think those are uh, uh, good or not. I mean, I'm definitely, I'm going out to eat a lot. I'm going out to le- eat a lot, Elise. I won't kid you. Where are we eating I, um, a lot? Where do, where do we like to go? Have you ever heard of the $6 nitro cold brew? Um, you get a can of one of the strongest coffees you will ever get. And it is about $6 here in Los Angeles. The way that she worded this, like the $6 nitro cold brew, I was for sure expecting it to be like a specific brand, but it wasn't. It was just nitro cold brew in general, which I don't know why, but that just makes me laugh. Is it a brand? There's a brand? Oh, there's all sorts of brands. There's Stumptown. There's, okay. I mean, I'm sure they all have monstrous backstories. Uh, But (laughs) yeah. Okay, time for one more break. When we come back, Maria tells us about the personality-based recipes that she writes in her book. I do a lot of writing for this show, and I always try to be really careful about my spelling, my grammar, and just the overall quality of my writing, but it's hard when I'm moving so quickly to check everything. That's why every single day, I'm super thankful for Grammarly. They've helped me come off so much more confident in my writing, and also, I just feel more confident sending emails, like all of the emails. Grammarly does more than just fix grammar and typos. With Grammarly Premium, it takes your writing to the next level. To me, Grammarly is like having my own personal writing consultant right there with me, letting me know when I'm maybe being a little indirect or less concise than I could be. It's those little checks with their software that make all the difference for me, helping me strike the perfect tone and actually getting things done. The free version of Grammarly offers instant proofreading with comprehensive spelling, grammar, and punctuation suggestions. They also offer a tone detector, but I recommend the premium version, which offers clarity-focused sentence rewrites. You'll be amazed at what you can do with Grammarly. Go to Grammarly.com slash podcast to download for free today. That's G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y dot com slash podcast. Say goodbye to those old antacid brands and say hello to Wonderbelly Antacid. If you're like me and get heartburn from basically everything, you're going to love Wonderbelly. I know that for me, heartburn and indigestion can really affect how I'm feeling and even impact what I choose to eat, which is a huge bummer. I want hot sauce, you guys. I need hot sauce. Wonderbelly's chewable antacids instantly get rid of heartburn, acid indigestion, and a sour belly using the same active ingredients as many of the leading brands. Only Wonderbelly doesn't have talc, artificial dyes, artificial sweeteners, titanium dioxide, or GMOs. And they come in these super cute and colorful aluminum bottles. Wonderbelly antacids come in four delicious flavors, strawberry milkshake, lemon sorbet, watermelon mint, and fruity cereal. The strawberry milkshake one is my personal favorite. It's an antacid tablet that actually tastes like strawberries blended into vanilla ice cream topped with whipped cream. And it's dairy-free. And as if the flavors weren't enough, listen to Wonderbelly's tagline for this ad. Let's kick acid. Obsessed. You can get Wonderbelly antacid at Target or shop on Amazon with code 20 Elise M to get 20% off. That's 20 E L Y S E M, all one word for 20% off on Amazon. I really wanted to go back to your book because 
I saw like you do recipes, right? For yeah. your family. Yes. And I wanted to know where the inspiration for that came because I think it's so cool. Oh, um, yeah, I just, I'm not a cook. I don't like cooking. So I was just trying to think of, yeah, things that I would make for them if I, if I had the, you know, that were in the emotional state yeah. of that family member. Um, cause my family, we do, has liked food and my parents have passed now. So, um, I try to eat in their honor. <laughs> I love. So, are the the recipes are the the food or they're a, like personality recipes? They're personality them? based re- recipes. So they're like, um, if you're gonna make something for my mom, uh, it's all based in confidence. So whatever you have gotten, it better be the best, and it's the best of everything, and the most choice ingredients, and there's a story behind every uh, cheese and. Uh, which is how my mother was. My mom didn't necessarily get the best, but she always she always sold it as it being the best thing. That's like really did you, did you see somebody do that when you were younger and you're like I want to do that or was did that just come from you making that up one day? I think it's only with her death that I realized, oh my god, my mom just she put a spin on everything that it was the most tremendous, she would always say things like, ever since I was a little girl, I've wanted to go to St. Louis in the spring and see, what? Nobody wants to go to St. Louis in the spring. (laughs) I don't even know enough about St. Louis to know you shouldn't want to go there in the spring. So I'm like, totally. (laughs) Well, the traffic is terrible, but no, yeah, my mom, she would just have just be delighted and excited about everything. And I love that about her. And I hope that I, in a slow bleed, just become her. Although I have a feeling I'm a little too grumpy. Have, um, have you ever written a recipe for yourself? Oh, yeah. Well, a recipe for myself is the restaurant that I would open up, which would be Caesar salads mm. and ice cream, hot fudge sundaes. So it'd be Caesar creamers. And, um, yeah, I love the Caesar salad, but I love a Caesar salad. There's I had one Caesar salad once that had a soft boiled egg in it. Mm. And it was the best thing I think I've ever eaten. Um, maybe I was just hungry. And then hot fudge Sundays I will eat at any time of day or year. And they're so delicious. So I have a question because me and my production team actually got into a, a small conversation about whether a hot fudge sundae is a meal or a snack that's definitely a meal no because you got the nut i believed in you (laughs) you got the nut you got the you got the cherry that's fiber but are you what size are we talking like not like a i I guess you're right the size the size makes the difference but i was thinking like you know the little cups it's like a cup with like a scoop of ice cream and that that would be like a snack for me that's one well, that's not even a Sunday. Oh, okay. You what's know, your that's what's a not sun- even a hot fudge Sunday? Sunday? Hot fudge Sunday is the standard is a peanut butter parfait, hot fudge penis ice cream, whipped cream, cherry topper. You go for the eye; it takes the fight right out of them. Um, yeah, it's got to be large. I just know half of my team is cheering wildly, and the other half is very disappointed in this answer. <laughs> okay. Caesar creamers sounds like it should be a real thing. Yeah. I I've seen restaurant reality shows and I don't have it in me. So if anybody wants to take the lead on that. That's fair. <laughs> I don't know. I could see you doing it. Uh, retired Caesar creamers just like just going for it. <laughs> no. My retirement job is used bookstore. Okay. Used bookstore. Um my friends already have one. They've hired me on a volunteer basis in the past, and I just, I feel like that's where I could be of good use. I just trained to be a peer specialist, uh, a mental health counselor. What's that? It's something in most states in the U.S. you can train to be a peer advocate, which is someone with lived mental health or addiction experiences 
and is now used as sort of like a helpful person that either goes out on emergency psychiatric um, calls. It's, it's sort of used instead of 911, and it pays about 18 to $25 an hour. And um, I've trained to be one, and I'm taking my exam on Wednesday. Wow. And yeah. So you would do that and a used bookstore? Yes. Well, and I think I would need the training to open a used bookstore. That's wild. Um, we have like five uh, little bonus questions at the end we like to ask people. Okay. Is it okay if I ask okay. you those? Sure, sure. Okay. okay, so these five questions are a part of our premium content. Um, and I usually ask every guest these five questions and we upload them as separate little episodes on Apple Premium. But we wanted to include this for Maria since it's kind of one of our last episodes before I go on maternity leave. So enjoy. Okay, uh, number one is most embarrassing or funniest encounter you've ever had with a famous person. Oh, oh, once I told John Hamm, because I didn't know who he was, um, I saw him at a play reading, and I I told him, you're really good. No, you're really good. You're a very good actor. And he's like, I know. And I'm like, seriously. <laughs> like, you should do this for a living. <laughs> Did you just not know who he was? I just didn't know he was. It's all right. I love. Did he? Did someone like how? How did that resolve? Did he, he tell you who he was? He was did ext- tell you? No, he was just very gracious. He was just like, thank you. He was very uh, patient and kind. And did someone tell you that's John Hamm? Uh, I think I realized it later. Yeah, oh, after gosh. afterwards. Yeah, I love that so much. That would. <laughs> that is such. That is a very me thing to do. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, number two, what was your first job? Um, I was a babysitter, which was terrifying. And then I did, um, uh, I was a waitress, okay. uh, waitressing at a Spanish restaurant. Did you like doing when that? 16. Um, I was terrible at it. I found it so frightening, but I did it for a long time. I did it waitressing for about six years through college and stuff and I never got better at it perfect it was just yeah (laughs) you were like I am here for one reason and one reason only and it's to pay my bills and that's got to be enough and I did not succeed in doing that either perfect (laughs) (laughs) just a fail all around I love that (laughs) yes yeah uh number three what is your go-to meal right now meal yeah Uh, um I like a salad in a bag. A Caesar salad, salad in a bag, yeah. And then I'll get some beans from a can with some sliced cheese. I'll melt those, and then I'll make myself a taco sal. Mm. Okay, so it's decided. I am never going to say the whole word salad ever again. I'm just saying sal for the rest of my life. And um, melt those and then put it into the salad in sort of a slurry with, mm. uh, with Thousand Island dressing. Thousand Island. You make a f- you're making a face. No, I'm I'm and- picturing it. I'm pregnant. What what I was thinking was, I love a good bag <laughs> salad. And then I thought you were gonna say you make like a bean dip. And I was like, okay, she's making a dip and a salad. And I was trying to pr- predict where you were going, and I did not. <laughs> no, it's a well. I mean, it could be uh, it could be like a a veggie bean cup, but it's you no, know, it's a. a bowl of um, melted cheese and bean with lettuce in it. I also like that you you uh, explained that the beans came from a can and the cheese came from a bag. I just liked yeah. that you were that descriptive with it. That, and then that was really my favorite part. Oh, good. Yes. <laughs> uh, number four, what was the last thing that you Googled? Do you remember? Oh, languages and uh, Brooklyn. Um, my The last thing I Googled was uh, photos of sidewalks because I was making a video and needed to do a green screen in front of a sidewalk. <laughs> oh, nice. Oh, I thought you were t- maybe trying to remember what sidewalks look like because you're doing those things, you know, when your security question, they have to identify oh, everything yes. as a sidewalk. <laughs> yes. You know what? You get very philosophical when you start to answer those because you're like, what is a street light? What yeah. what constitutes a street light? Is it the corner? Is that a street light? Is that the edge of it? Yeah. <laughs> and I've got, I apparently don't know my objects as well as I thought I did. <laughs> and then the last thing is, what is something that you know more about than you should or more than other people? Um, I think I know a lot about 12-step programs. Okay. Um, I don't know, uh, I don't follow them very well. I just know 
I, I can get in there deep with you on whatever 12-step program you're interested in hearing about. I feel like that is a very helpful thing to know more about because mine are always useless. It's like I'm I'm holding space in my brain for this thing that does not matter, but yours is actually very helpful. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Maria, it has been so good to meet you. This has been such an honor to get to talk to you today. Yes, lovely to meet you, and thank you for having me on, on your podcast. I didn't know who John Hamm was, and so that's the level of uh, disconnection from the world I'm at. I apologize. <laughs> no, don't apologize. I wouldn't know who John Hamm was if I saw him in the face. If I, I know a name, but I do not connect names and faces ever. And so, if I saw the most famous person in the world in front of me, I would convince myself that that's not them. I just my brain doesn't understand it at all. Usually, they're very tiny. They're very tiny people. Yes. John Hamm was large, uh, okay. but it didn't affect my not knowing no. him. <laughs> well, Maria, thank you so much. Thank you, Elise. Thank you. Okay, that's it for our episode. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Funny Because It's True. Stay tuned after this interview to hear an audio clip from Maria's book, Sure, I'll Join Your Cult. And if you like this show, give us a rating and a review on Apple. It helps other people find us. Bye. Introduction. Sure, I'll join your cult. I love being asked to join, so much so that I will say yes to an invitation without knowing exactly what I've agreed to. When I was in my late 20s, a fellow production secretary at Nickelodeon Animation Studio, whom I will call Tina, told me about an event she was attending at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel and asked me to accompany her. Of course, Tina! Tina had been going through some difficulties that involved muffled weeping in the bathroom. I wanted to support and hope there might be food. There was not. Tina seemed very excited about this whole evening, and when I met her in the 500-seat conference room packed to the gills, it felt like a great way to spend a Tuesday night. A few different speakers got up and talked about how they had once been pathetic. And now, thanks to heart bouncers, they were vigorous and empowered. Awesome! I applauded and whooped. Good for them! After the speechifying, we were encouraged to stand up and share openly about our personal sorrows, why we were all there that night. Several people stood, verklempt, detailing varying degrees of failure and tragedy in life. As the event was taking place in L.A., there was no shortage of people available for dramatic public speaking off the cuff. I thought, great. I mean, a little irresponsible because there didn't seem to be any therapeutic professionals available. What the hell? Everybody seemed hyped and happy. Did I stand up in freestyle prose? No, not for lack of desire, but I'd already been getting all my monologuing out at open mics and 12-step support groups. And these sad sack recruits seemed like they had never told anyone anything personal. That to them, talking to a big group about private issues was a revelatory breakthrough. I thought I'd be generous and give my time back to the room. Thanks so much for listening to this excerpt from Maria Bamford's book, Sure, I'll Join Your Cult. If you're interested in reading the whole book, head to our show notes for more information. Thanks for listening to the episode. Bye. There's more funny because it's true with Lemonada Premium. Get access to all of Lemonada's premium content, including My Five Questions with Fortune Beamster, which came out last Friday. Subscribe now in Apple Podcasts. Funny Because It's True is a Lemonada Media and Powder Keg production. The show is produced by Claire Jones and Zoe Dennis. Our senior producer is Jamila Zara-Williams, and our associate producer is Oha Lopez. Rachel Neal is our senior director of new content, and our VP of weekly production is Steve Nelson. Executive producers are Stephanie Whittles-Wax, Jessica Cordova-Kramer, Paul Feig, Laura Fisher, Kessla Childers, and me, Elise Myers. This show is mixed by Johnny Vince Evans, additional help from Noah Smith and Ivan Kryev. Our theme song music was written by me and scored by Xander Singh. Follow Funny Cause It's True wherever you get your podcasts or listen ad-free on Amazon Music with your Prime membership. Boom-doo-doo-doo-boom-doo. 
What's up, everyone? I'm Delaney Fisher, comedian and serial entrepreneur. And I'm Kelsey Cook, comedian and, I swear this is real, a world champion foosball player. <laughs> On our podcast, Self Helpless, we dig into everything from heartbreak to career burnout to the wild stories from our 20s and the many anxieties we've experienced along the way. We're often joined by guests who range from celebrities to renowned health experts. And together, we'll unpack big topics like deciding whether or not we want kids, building your dream career, strengthening self-trust, and much, much more. So join us every Monday for an unfiltered, entertaining, and honest conversation with friends where you don't even have to leave your house. If you're not wearing pants, we will never know. That's right. So listen to (laughs) Self Helpless wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, listeners, I'm here today to tell you about Lemonada Media's newest limited podcast series called Declined. This 10-part series takes you through the journey of two exceptional women from incarceration to freedom, ultimately leading to the creation of the Returning Artists Guild, an organization that uplifts the artwork of currently and formerly incarcerated artists across the country. Call Declined premieres November 27th wherever you get your podcasts. Casts. 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 Casts.